Well, welcome back, everyone. This is uh, Dr. Josh with Digital Hammurabi, and I uh, almost, almost kept myself muted. Uh, so it was good, good, I guess, that we caught that. So uh, welcome back to another uh, lesson in learning biblical Hebrew. This has been quite a busy weekend for me, but uh, I'm glad to glad to be with you guys. Happy Father's Day to all you fathers out there, and I will be calling uh, those fathers in my life uh, here probably after the stream. So if you haven't, uh, you know, reach out, and thank them. Uh, of course, that assumes things about your relationship with your fathers. So I probably shouldn't do that anyway. Uh, if you recall, we are here learning biblical Hebrew. So this is, this is lesson 13, I think. And we are making our way through Chun Leong Seau's book, A Grammar for Biblical Hebrew, which I have, <laughs> I, uh, I realized this morning, I have not been putting in the description. So it is there now. So there should be a link there. Yeah, I highly recommend getting the book. It's what I learned with and uh, Megan learned with as well. And in conjunction, of course, with this series, I think it should be um, actually very effective. So, uh, And then after we do, we're in lesson 11 today, looking at the construct chain. And after we do that uh, for 30 or 45 minutes, um, then we will move into reading through um First Kings. So I know that we said we were going to move to the book of Jonah and that the last time we read was going to be the last time we were in First Kings. But uh, I thought we should probably go ahead and keep going through it. And I'm going to save the book of Jonah for um, when uh, when Dr. Brendan Benz can come on with us. So I don't uh, I don't want to pressure him to come on. So I know he's got a lot going on in his life. So um, as we all do. So anyway, we are going to pick up in uh, chapter 11. Before I do, though, uh, just a sort of a segue here. I'm going to put up a banner. This Wednesday, we have uh, Dr. Joel Baden coming on. And I don't know that we'll actually entitle the stream this, but uh, for those of you that have been with us or have studied Old Testament, um, the Old Testament scholarship, particularly the Pentateuch. I've entitled this J.E.D. Please explain the Pentateuch to me. So uh, Dr. Joel Baden uh, up at Yale is a um, uh, studies, you know, Pentateuchal scholarship, and he um, holds to the uh, like a, a more up to date uh, or. Um, Sorry, I'm blanking on the term that I want to use, but a, a more developed uh, documentary hypothesis. So those of you that that know about uh, the formation of the Pentateuch and the theories behind it, uh, J-E-D-P, the Yahwist, the Elohist, the um, Deuteronomist, and the Priestly Source. So he's going to come on on Wednesday and sort of lay all that out for us. Um, so it should be a really, really good time and a very enlightening uh, stream. So, you know, there are different theories for how the Pentateuch was put together. There's the documentary hypothesis, the fragmentary hypothesis, the supplementary hypothesis. And if you don't know what those things are, come out on Wednesday and you'll find out. So uh, the other thing is uh, in the side chat, there was a question of how do you say worm in Hebrew? And I tried to um, uh, I tried to uh, write it in um, transliteration, but it's tola'at, so tola'at. And the only reason that I remember that is uh, I there's a program called The Learnables. I don't know if anybody's familiar with it, but actually it's a really great little program. I used it for uh, German, I used it for French, and uh, also for Hebrew. We tried to use it for Mandarin, but we couldn't get the CD to work on our computer, which is probably my fault. Uh, but it's great, great program. Anyway, there's a part where a little boy goes outside and he uh, he picks up a worm and he puts it in his pocket and his mother says, what's that in your pocket? And he pulls it out and says, tola'at, tola'at. So, uh, <laughs> so you said worm and I went, that's tola'at. But let me check and just make sure because it's been several years since I've heard that. So tola'at is worm. So there you go. Okay. Um, 
If you do have questions or comments, please put them in the side chat. I've got it up here. Uh, Craig Nightwolf, loved your interview yesterday. Thank you so much. Um, I don't know which one uh, I did. I did two sort of back to back. There was one on um, on uh, adherent apologist. Uh, sorry, adherent apologetics at four. And uh, there was one on the atheist roundtable that I did at uh, one o'clock. Both were a lot of fun and uh, yeah, t- tough topics uh, to discuss, but um, but good, good nonetheless. So go check those out. Subscribe to their channels uh, if you haven't already. It's good content. So, OK, let's go ahead and get into the lesson. So we are in uh, chapter 11, which on in Seau's book is on page 116, and we are looking at the construct chain today. So what is the construct chain? Well, in English, if we want to say um, the, let's say, if we want to say um, if we want to say the house that belongs to the man, we might say the man's house, or if we're going to be a little more formal, the house of the man. It looks like ma'am, doesn't it? Okay. The word of here and the relationship between these two nouns, not the man, uh, is a genitival construction. That's the sort of the technical term. So of, X of Y. So, you know, something belongs to something else usually is how it's, um, how it appears. But putting the word of, to keep it really simple here, uh, to put something of something else. So the house of the man, the man's house. Well, you know, Hebrew doesn't have this separate word of, and instead what they do They put essentially the house, man, and they change the they change the form a little bit of this word to tell you that it is connected to the following word. Um, oftentimes, it's by putting a little that makaf at the top, that little horizontal line that connects the two words. And then it makes some vowel changes underneath to tell you that it's connecting to the next word. And what they say is this is a construct chain. So if you think about a chain, you know, it's words that are linked together, things that links that are linked together. Uh, And so this happens. uh, These words are considered to be linked to one another. Okay, so how does that how does that actually play out? That's sort of the idea. How does it play out? Um, so let's just do our example. The word bite is house, and then ish. I never use the examples that say I'll use it. Sorry about that. Um, bite ish. Well. Right now, uh, if they wanted to say the house of the man, they would have to do two things. First, they would have to make ish definite. Right? Should probably keep these separate colors. And can anybody tell me why I've made that uh, comets and said instead of a, a pathak or a patach? That's right, as they would say on Dora and Dora the Explorer. Uh, it's compensatory lengthening, right? Because you can't have a um, a short vowel and an open, unaccented syllable, so you get ha ish. So. Uh, let me, I guess I could, I need to start here. This is called the absolute noun. This one right here. 
and this one is called the construct noun. Now, what does that mean? Um, this one is not going to change in this construct chain. When remember how I said that they'll change the vowels or they'll change the form a little bit of the word when it's in the construct chain or when it's in the construct form, this word here will not change. So they say that it is absolute. It's, it's not going to change. It's in the absolute state. This one, this word is in the construct state. And so you reconstruct it. It's maybe a way to think about it. So what do you do? What is it that, what are the changes that take place? Well, if you think about it this way, essentially to link these words together, if you put a makaif there, what they're saying in a way is they're considering this whole thing to be one word. It doesn't always play out this way, but it's, it's a good, good, good way to start thinking about it. So if that's all considered one word, how many accents are in one word? One. Well, what does that mean? Well, this accent would disappear because this word, ish, ha-ish, already has an accent, right? So this accent would disappear. So what happens when, for example, in the word bite, what happens when the accent leaves? What happens when it shifts? Well, we know that bite, this aya, um, that aya diphthong will go to, it'll contract, they say, to a. So baya, bayit will go to bait. So the accent shifts because it's the accent's already down here. So this one sort of disappears. And this contracts so that you say this sort of all is one word. You don't say bait uh, ha'ish. You say betaish, betaish. So bait ha'ish goes to betaish. And what this means is the house of the man. So they're connecting those two. So this word bait is now in construct form, they say. It's in it's in it's in it's a construct noun, it's in construct form, and this is the absolute noun. Okay, let's let's try this. Um let me use one of his examples here just so I can sort of um So now I think, I think that's fine. Um, so, but let, let's talk about the chain. So, you can have more than one in the same way that a chain can have more than two links. You can have multiple links. The same is true in a construct chain. So you could say, um, you could say the house of the man oops or uh yeah uh the man actually instead of coming up with them let's <laughs> just use uh yeah okay okay he says he uses the example son of the man of, I'm just going to say the king. The son of the man of the king. All right, what are those three words? So son is Bane, right? Uh, man is, as we saw, Ish. And king is Melech. It's all crooked, sorry. Okay, now you noticed, if, if you remember from the, the last example that we just did, what was it? It was the, the house of the man. You will remember, I didn't say uh, ha-bait, 
uh, Ha'ish. Because if you remember, they're considering this to be one word, right? So you're not going to have a definite article here and a definite article here. You don't have, you can only have one marker of definiteness on a word, right? And if these are considered part of a chain, if they're considered to be joined together, then you're just going to have the definite marker on the very last word, on the absolute noun. So you don't have it here. You just say bait ha'ish. So whether this word appears with a definite article or not is irrelevant because it's not going to. It's always going to be you know, un unmarked, unmarked for definiteness. Um, you have to look at the last word in that chain, the absolute noun, in order to figure out, is this a definite, is it a house of a man? Um, or is it the house of the man? Okay, so in our example, what did we say? The son of, so Bain, Ish. And then we wanted to say the king. Oops. So how would we connect these? Well, um, we could do Makaifs. And now, you know, this word had an accent here, this word had an accent here, and this word obviously has an accent here. But if they disappear, what are the changes that are going to take place? Well, long vowels like this sere, uh, you know, they, they're, they're pronounced longer, so bane as opposed to ben. So one of the things that happens is because there's no accent and you're trying to sort of go past it very quickly uh, because you're trying to get to the accent, get to the accented syllable when you when you say words. Um, and of course we, we do this in English as well. Um, what's that word? Anti-disestablishment Arianism. So Arianism. Air has the has the accent, so you don't say anti disestablishment, right? It's anti disestablishment Arianism. You're kind of racing in a way past you know all the syllables that come up to the accented syllable, and the same thing is true here. So if you're trying to read over these quickly and not put accents on them, a lot of times you'll either get long vowels becoming short uh, or vowel reductions. So a long vowel going to Shiva. So those are the, the two sort of things that you see all the time. We'll go through the individual changes that you'll see, uh, but those are the two things. So for example, here, Bain would go to Ben. So Benish HaMelech, Benish HaMelech, instead of Bain, Ish HaMelech. Benish HaMelech. So these, this means the, because of that, Ha, uh, son of the, even though you don't have the here on either of these, you don't have it because this definite article affects everything that comes before it. It, it affects the whole chain. So the son of, the man of, the king All right so ostensibly like theoretically you could have the son of the man of the house of the dog of the king and right? you could have all those things in a chain um it's not terribly common to have so many in a row like that so uh, but just kind of getting the principle down that you can have more than one uh more than one noun in a construct chain okay uh, he he notes here that so if if, if that doesn't make sense, uh, please uh, ask me in the comments section to uh, go back and and you know review or explain it again. 
But just the basic principle of they're considering these words in a construct chain to be, maybe not always, but very often, united together as a, as a word. So, for example, one of the things that you'll see if you have a noun here and a noun here in the Masoretic text, and actually we'll see, you can see it here, they'll have sometimes accent marks that point to each other. The cantillation marks, they call them. They'll point to each other. So there are certain marks um, that sort of tell you, keep going, uh, This the next word is connected. So um, I'm just gonna try to find one here. Sorry, everyone. Okay. Um, it's not a good example because we haven't really learned that yet. Um, all right. Good grief. Okay, well, here you see Ben Makaif Yehoyada. Right, this would normally be Bain Yehoyada, but because it's now the son of Jehoiada, uh, they put the makaf. This Bain goes to Ben, so it's a short vowel. Notice there's no accent mark here. Right, here's your accent mark right there. This little carrot-looking thing. Um, so this is in construct. Ben is in construct to the absolute noun Yehoyada. Okay. Well go through all that here in a few minutes. Okay, so uh, Sayal talks about if you have a construct chain in the same way that if you had a chain with a bunch of links in it, you wouldn't want to interrupt that chain because then the chain sort of loses its chain status. Uh, in the same way, if you have a construct chain like this and you have an adjective that is talking about one of the links in the chain, the adjective is not going to you know, go in the middle of the chain. The chain is going to finish out, and then the adjective will come after. And you just have to be able to figure out which one is it referring to. Now, again, normally there aren't so many links in the chain that it's, it's difficult to figure out uh, which one it is, but the examples, he gives a couple of examples here. So let's talk about them. Ben Ha Isha Oh, sorry. Ha Uh, run out of room. Ha. Uh, uh, okay. So Ben Haisha. Let's just take that first. Ben Haisha. So Ish. Where are we? Isha. Haisha is the woman. So Ish Isha. Isha is woman. Haisha the woman. Notice the makaf here. Bain has gone to Ben because it's in construct. So Ben Haisha, the son of, notice the son of the woman, but then the adjectives or the adjectival terms here. Ha tova, so tova is feminine singular. Zot is feminine singular. So these are these uh, are clearly referring to not Ben or Bain, uh, but they're referring to Haisha. So it would be this good, uh, sorry, the son of this good woman, right? So the this and the good are describing the woman because they're both in the feminine singular, so they match, right? However, if you said, to keep the, oops. Ben. Uh, yeah, gracious Josh. 
האישה, הטוב, הזה, now, טוב and זה are both masculine singular forms. So which one are they referring to? They can't be referring to ha'isha because this is a feminine word. It's gendered feminine. So here it must be saying this good son of the woman. But notice that it's not, they're, they're not saying ben ha'tov ha'ze ha'isha because that would interrupt the construct chain. They're not going to do that. They're going to put it afterwards. So it would be ben ha'isha ha'tov ha'zeh. Okay. Good. I, it's like you, I say okay, and you guys are going to be like, yeah, sure. And I'll definitely be able to hear you when you say that. Uh, there is something that we need to recognize. And if you remember, what is it that can make a noun definite? There are three things that we've seen, right? Number one, if it has the hey path act doubling dot, right, that would make it definite. So ha ish, the man. Um, if it has a uh, an object suffix, so um, actually the one that we see probably more often is e. So instead of melech, you get malki. So the E ending would be my king. That would make it definite. So anytime there's a, an object suffix it's, uh, appended to the noun, that would make it definite. And then finally, if you have a proper noun. So, you know, David, uh, Jonathan, Nathan, any of those proper nouns, like a name, uh, will be definite because we're talking about a particular person, okay? So if the absolute noun in a construct chain uh, contains any one of these markers, either it's a proper noun or it has an object suffix or it has the definite article on it, then the whole construct chain will be definite. Now, a question that you see sometimes is what if you wanted to say uh, so, so if we had, let's say, um, Ben David, how would you translate this? The son of David, right? Because that is definite. David is a definite thing. Problem is, what if you wanted to say a son of David? Well, you can't put it in construct then. What they do, instead of putting that in construct, is they will say, ah, it's not going to work, it's too close. They'll say, Bain, so in its non-construct form, right? Its absolute form. L, David. So this would be a son of David. So a son to, or, you know, it's a son of David, but this is how they mark a genitival relationship with a, a noun that is definite without putting it in the construct. This is how they do it. They say, Bain le David. Now, a place that you'll see this all the time is if you read the Psalms. Mismor le David. Mizmur le David. This is a psalm of David. If you said Mizmur David, it would be the psalm of David because it would be in construct. And they, they don't want to say that because there are a lot of psalms. 
attributed to David. So they they want they want to say a psalm of David, Mizmor le David, Adonai roi lo echsal. Those of you that recognize Psalm twenty three, if you do, you should probably be uh, doing this because to recognize that just for me saying it, I've memorized that a long time ago. So um, anyway. <laughs> Okay, so what are some of the changes that will take place? But we are not moving through this quickly, are we? Does all of this make sense? If if you're if you're listening and it's making sense, or if it's sort of making sense, uh, if you feel like it, drop me a little note saying, "Yeah, it makes sense." Um, okay, so we've talked about this. Uh, one of the things that you'll see is. A tsere. Oh, no. Just this long eval here will change to a short e. So Bane will go to Ben. And that makes sense, right? Long vowels tend to go shorter because you can move, uh, excuse me, past them quicker. Uh, also, in, in the same uh, sense, Oops. A long A vowel. So this is a long E vowel going to a short E vowel. A long A vowel here. The comets will go to a short A. So Yad will go to Yad. So long vowels tend to go to shorter vowels. It's not always the case. There's uh, an example that doesn't make as much sense, but uh, uh, we'll get to that in just a second. But I'll show you the most common ones. So long vowels will often go to short vowels. We saw the diphthongs aya, and if you remember the other one, ave. So bait and mavet, aya and ave will go, they will contract to a and o, respectively. So bait will go to bait. Mavit will go to moat. So if you saw moat, that's a construct noun, death of, you know, or the death of something. So Ava and Aya will go to O or O and A respectively. Uh, something that you'll see all the all the time. We've seen it a couple of times, or many times actually already. Actually, I'll just do it this way. The ending "im" for the plural "im." We saw that the mem will shrink down into its array. So "im" will go to a. So, Melachim, actually that's not a good example because I'll have to explain that in just a second. Actually, that's not a good example either. Um, damn. Uh, okay, well let's, let's do it the other way then. If you remember segalets, like the word melech, you remember a segalet is if you have two segols, not always segols, but that's what they're named after. With this penultimate stress, this uh, accent not on the last syllable, not here, but over here, these are called segolets. And if you remember, segolets have a consistent and unique way of forming the plural. Shiva comets. So melech goes to Melachim. If you remember these words like Melech, oops, or um, Sefer, that's not a good example. I mean, it is, but uh, why can't I think of, uh, I can't think of another example off the top of my head. Anyway. If you remember, Melech was originally Malk.
Malk. It was a a one syllable base word, Malk. And that shows up when you put an ending on. So if you wanted to say my king, you would get Malki. So Melech goes to Malki. That one syllable based vowel shows back up. I don't know if we've covered this in the grammar, if we've just talked about it through translation, but um, so Sefer goes to Sif, Sif. Um, uh, Derech goes to Dark. So my way would be Darki. So it's either going to be a Pathak or a, a Hirik, usually as a one syllable base. Um, okay, so why did I say that? Uh, Melech. When you make it a plural, melachim, you would think that if you put this in construct, like you wanted to say the kings of the land, you would think that uh, you would just have that mem come down, shrink down, right? and be this dot right here in the tsere. But it doesn't. I mean, it does. But you don't get melache. What it does is it reverts back to that one-syllable base, malche. Um, what are the examples? I should probably just stick to the examples he gives here. Where are they? Okay, yeah, that's a better one. Okay, so uh, Adon is the word for Lord. If you wanted to make that plural, you would make that a regular nun. This comets, if you just kind of go back through this, if you were to syllabify this, you now have uh, a... Um, Oh, sorry. If you have a sorry, if you have an uh, comets or a and an open propertonic syllable, so here's your tone. Here's your pre so tonic syllable, pretonic syllable, propertonic syllable. If you have a comets or a sere, it gets reduced. I know we've talked about that ten thousand times. Sorry. So then, what you would see is a shava, but of course, this is an aleph. It's a guttural, so it doesn't want a regular shava. It wants a composite shava. So you get adonim, adonim. So the standard form here would be if you wanted to make this lords of something, that mem disappears, and this becomes Adonai, Adonai. That's the standard way that you make that a construct form. Okay. Um, just looking to see. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So just remember that if you have segalits, they're not going to, they're going to go back to that one syllable base. So instead of, sefer, if you make it plural, why did I do that? Sorry. Sefer, if you make it plural, since it's a segalit, it's going to go to, Shiva comets, Sfarim. However, if it goes into construct, that im goes to a, these vowels back here are going to go back to their the vowel of their one syllable base, which is hirik. So you'd get sifre. Sifre. Okay. Uh, what else? So we just to, to quickly recap, if you have a long vowel, either a sere or a, a comets, it's often going to go to a short version of that vowel. So a will go to eh, a will go to a. So again, you're trying to go past it quickly. 
So you're, you're trying not to pronounce the, the form so long. Uh, the word shalom. If you put this in construct, here you have a, a comet. So what you will see, shalom, it gets reduced. This happens a lot as well. So a comet. See, what is it, the rule that he says here? Yeah, so an open syllable, uh, that's the thing you want to think about, just, just like in everything else that we've seen. Let's go from the known to the unknown, sorry. Davar is word. Let's forget about the, the construct form for a second. If we wanted to make this a plural, we put the em ending on, right? Davar, and then what do we do? Well, we see it all the time. If you have an open propertonic syllable, with comets, it gets reduced. And the reason is you're trying to get past it. Devarim, devarim, instead of davarim. So the same thing is true with uh, these construct forms. So you're trying not to say shalom, you're trying to say shalom something. So if you wanted to say the piece of the land, you had shalom, and then you had uh, ha'aretz. Shalom ha'aretz. Well, if you're, you know, you have an accent here, shalom ha'aretz. However, if you're connecting these, that means that this accent is going to disappear, and this is all considered one word now. So now you have this open syllable with a long vowel, and what they're going to do is they're going to reduce that long vowel. Shalom, ha shalom ha'aretz. Shalom ha'aretz. Because they're, they're saying this all as one word. Shalom ha'aretz. Okay. So long vowels will often go to short vowels or they'll get reduced altogether. Uh, em endings will go to a, and then the the other two big things that the, the sorry the aya and the ave, um, uh, which we call it, uh, diphthongs will go to a. They'll contract to a and o, and then the last two things that you just want to know endings, um, sorry. Eh, so like um, ro eh, shepherd will go to ro a, eh, ro a, eh, which is the weird one, right? You wouldn't expect it to go long. Why does it go long? I don't have a good answer. I can probably dig into it and come out with a rationale, but um, that's the weird one. So this eh ending will go to a. Eh. It's a weird one. And then the last one, which is one that you will know and understand readily, and that is ah endings. We'll change to oops, ah, ot, which makes lots of sense, right? So let's say the word uh, Torah, and we wanted to say um to the the this is the law of let's say Moses Moshe um if you're connecting these two words now you've got this really big heavy thing hanging off the end and that hay is just not strong enough to hold it just like with those object suffix endings it's just not strong enough to hold it and we know that, right? I mean, if you if you think about it, this big gap right here, that's not a very strong letter. So this whole thing's just gonna crumple. You know, if, if if the weight of that is pulling it down, this 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 gap is gonna give way and the whole word's just gonna crumble, right? So what they do instead is they shore up that that breach and then they put this little foot on the end. 
And of course, that turns it into a tav, right? So Torah, and of course, you see that this makes sense, right? Uh, comets goes to a patach, a pathak, because the long A is going to a short A. They're trying to get, you know, get past it very quickly. So that makes sense. Torat Moshe, Torat Moshe, Torat Moshe. Okay, so the law of Moses. Um, so, ah, uh, we'll go to hot. Okay, I have to stop because it's been 45 minutes. That's pretty much the end of the construct. There's there's a little bit more in um, Seal's book that you can go, you know, look over yourself. These, these are the main things that I wanted to show you. Um, he talks about some irregular construct nouns. So Isha will go to Eshet, which is, you know, irregular. You would expect, for example, Isha, it's got that ah ending here. So you would expect it to go to Ishat, right? But it doesn't go to Ishat. It goes to Eshet. Eshet, which is weird. Um, so those are those irregular. In the same way that you memorize the irregular plurals, you have to memorize. Um, I don't even know if you have to memorize the forms, but just recognize uh, the most, most of the time the consonants are going to stay the same. Um, but just kind of recognize that sometimes the vowel patterns are a little irregular. They're outside of the, the things that you want to see. So, or the things that you expect to see. Okay. But definitely go through say out and check out the rest. He talks about some of the nuances of meaning for now, just translate it of. So if you have a noun in construct and a noun in absolute form, just say, uh, the something of something, so the house of David, or there are different ways that you can, certain circumstances where it doesn't have to be of, but I think for now, just recognizing the construct uh, form is important and sufficient. Okay, sorry, I feel like that was a little haphazard, but uh, hopefully it, it made some sense. We are in 1 Kings chapter 1 still. We're down in verse 28. If you remember, um, David has become very old, and um, he has promised, you know, earlier before this, before this passage, uh, he promised Bathsheba that... Um, that... Uh, Solomon, her son, would sit on the throne after him. And uh, as the text opens, we find out that Jehoiada has essentially proclaimed himself king, and he has done some of the things that a king would do. He'd offered sacrifices, and he's got a feast going on, and he's invited a bunch of people that are important to uh, the establishment of the, the kingship, but some key people he's left out. So Nathan the prophet and some of the priests, and he hasn't invited them. And it makes sense why, right? They would object to him proclaiming himself to be king. So uh, Nathan and Bathsheba sort of put this plan together. Bathsheba goes before the king and says, you know, here's what's going on. And at you know, while she's still speaking, Nathan comes in behind her and says, yep, that's exactly what's going on. And Nathan finishes and, and basically says, like, you know, what? What's the deal? You know, did you did you um, uh, I can't think of the word. You know, did you order this, uh, or is this something that he's doing? And so David is getting ready to respond. So we're in verse twenty eight, first Kings chapter one, down in verse uh, twenty eight. So again, if you have questions, please put them in the side chat let me so that I can feel good about having done this. I'll run that banner again. So, Vaya'an Hamelech David, Vayomer, Kil 
קראו לי לבת שווה, ותבוא לפני המלך, ותעמוד לפני המלך. So. Vayan HaMelech David. So this is a cow vowel consecutive and perfect. Uh, third singular from Anna. So again, just to remind everyone, we the first part of these uh, these lessons are for people that are learning the grammar. The second part uh, is more beneficial, I suppose, for people that have already gone through a fair amount of Hebrew grammar, and this is sort of for reading purposes. So just kind of going through some text and and uh, getting some exposure to it. But it's good for everybody to do to get that exposure. Um, so that's what we're doing here. So this vaya'an, so if you remember, ana, when you put this very heavy uh, vav yud on the front, it, you know, if you think about it on a, on a, uh, what is that thing called? Oh my God. A um, seesaw. That vav yud is very heavy and it pulls it down and it does it so quickly that hay just pops right off. So if you notice here, this is from ana. The hay just popped right off. So vaya'an. Vaya'an. Uh, so, and he answered. So, and who, who answered? Hamelech David. These words are an apposition to one another. So this is not, uh, uh, there are reasons that we know that this is not the king of David, right? Notice that if this were the king of David, there would not be a hay up here, right? If this were in the construct form, we would know this could not take the definite article, but it does. So this is the king, that is to say, David. So the, these two words are in opposition to one another. So in the king, David, um, King David uh, answered, Vayomer, and he said, Kir uli. So this is an imperative form from kara, so kuf reish aleph, to call, and it's a masculine plural. So call to me, summon to me, li, li lechalach lola, right? So li to me. And the lamid here is marking the direct object of the verb kara. So I suspect if we were to go look up the verb kara, we would see that often the object um, of this verb is marked with a lamid. And in English, it doesn't come over, you know, terribly well. We wouldn't say, call to me to Bathsheba. Um, but that's this is marking, who are you calling? Whom are you calling? Bathsheba. Uh, notice this is not Sheva, but Shava. It's because this uh, Athnak here, this Etnachta, is making this a, a pausal form. So it's making it a long vowel. You see that uh, quite a bit, actually. Levat Shava. So he says, call to me, summon to me, Bathsheba. And she came. So Kalvav, consecutive and perfect, uh, third feminine plural, uh, sorry, third feminine singular from Bo. Atavo, and she came, Lifne Hamelech. Lifne is before, in front of Hamelech, and she came before the king. Vata'amod, Kao Vav, consecutive and perfect, third feminine singular, just like this one, from Ahmad. If you remember Ahmad, you picture Ahmad Rashad standing in the end zone, waiting to catch that pass. Ahmad, Ahmad Rashad standing in the end zone, ready to catch that pass. So Ahmad means to stand, because Ahmad Rashad, standing in the end zone. It'll never get old, will it? You guys are like, that'll never get old. Uh, so, and she stood, Lifne HaMelech. She stood before the king. Vayishava uh, HaMelech, Vayomar, Chai Adonai, Asher Pada Et Nafshi. This is going to be complicated. Mikol Tzara. All right. A little clunky. Sorry. 
So, Vayishava, this is a nifal form, and we'll talk about this when we get to it, but you can see the nun has assimilated, for those of you that have learned nifal, you can see the nun is assimilated here into the sheen, and you have uh, sort of the, um, the, uh, the tell that this form has is the, the doubled first radical and this uh, commas under the front. So, uh, ekatel, tikatel, tikatali, yikatel, tikatel. So this is from Shava. In the nifal, it means to swear. But it's a, just a nifal, vav consecutive and perfect, third masculine singular. So, and the king swore, took an oath, and he said, um, again, another pausal form here, so instead of vayomer, it's vayomar, Chai Adonai. So Chai is life. Notice it's in the construct form. You have the makef here. So the life of the Lord. We might say this as the Lord lives. But, you know, literally the life of the Lord, the life of Yahweh. As Yahweh lives. And then Asher is setting up a relative clause. So it's referring to Adonai here. Um, who pada is to ransom. So this is just a cow perfect, third masculine singular from pada, hey, dalit, hey, who ransomed, so as the Lord lives, who ransomed et, direct object marker, definite direct object marker. This comes from, obviously, the word nefesh, right? But, when you put the object suffix e on, it goes back to its one syllable base, which is nafsh, nafsh, so nafshi, my soul, my life, who ransomed my life. <laughs> uh, you know, ransom, rescue, save. Um, Mikol tsara. So this is min, right, added to coal, which when it goes into the construct form, which we see here, that long O gets shortened to coal. So this is mikol um, tsara. Tsara is like trouble. So who saved my soul from all trouble, so let's try to keep the, the flow of the, of the uh, speech in line here or in mind. So, and, uh, just trying to remember it. So, and the king swore saying, as the Lord lives, who ransomed my soul from all trouble. Key here is uh, setting up the oath formula. Right, it's setting up what's what's getting ready to be sworn. So essentially, I mean, we could bring this into English. Uh, and he swore, what? What is it that he swore? That ki kasher nishbati lach badonai Elohei Yisrael lemor ki shlomo v'nech yimloch acharai v'hu yeshev al kisi tachtai. So he's you know, he's making this, uh, he's getting ready to pronounce uh, who's going to who's going to rule, something that maybe he should have done before. Who knows? Um, okay. So what is it that he swore? Just as or even as Ka'asher, Nishbati, so another Nifal, uh, perfect. First common singular from Shin Beit Ein. So even as or just as I swore Lach to you, speaking to um, Bathsheba here, notice the feminine singular. Li Lacha Lach Lo La. Badonai, by the Lord. Um, Elohe Yisrael, notice Elohim has is now in construct. So the Im has gone to A. So Elohei Yisrael, so the God of Israel. 
um, Lemur sang. And again, another key sort of setting up uh, the content of what he swore that Solomon, your son, Bain, son, um, Ech is the object suffix, and this Tsere, um reduces to Shiva. So that's how you get that form. Benech. That Solomon, your son, Yimloch. So this is a Cal imperfect, third masculine singular from Malach. You can see the word Melech, Malach, to rule. So, um, Emloch, Timloch, Timlochi, Yimloch, Timloch. This is just the Cal uh, standard pattern. Eshmor, Tishmor, Tishmori, Yishmor, Tishmor. Uh, so he will reign, <clears throat> sorry, let me just, okay, saying, sort of quote, Solomon, your son, will reign acharai after me. So acharai is after, and then after me will be acharai. The hu yeshev al kisi tachtai. The hu, so hu, uh, I know we always do this, I'm sorry. Um, but me is who, who is he, and he is she. Me is who, who is he, he is she. I don't know, does that help anybody? It helped me. Yes. Anyway, so who in Hebrew is he in English. So, and he, uh, yeshev, so this is from Yashav. And what you're doing here is you're adding the imperfect suffix yud. And when you do, um, it essentially wipes out. And we'll talk about this when we get there, but it wipes out that uh, consonant. And you end up with yeshav. So the paradigm is a shave, te shave, te shave, ye shave, te shave. So he will sit, because remember when Yashav, you chin bait, when Yashav somebody, they sit down. That's what they do. Try not to sit down when someone shaves you. When Yashav somebody, they sit down. So and he will sit al kis e. So kise is throne, kis e will be my throne. And he will sit upon my throne, Tachtai. So this is from Tachat. Um, often means under. So Tachat HaShulchan, tachat ha-shulchan would be under the table. But um, Tachat can also mean like in place of, in my place. So Tachtai would be in place of me. So what was the promise? Just to sort of keep it all together here. Uh, so he swears that just as I swore to you uh, by the Lord, the God of Israel, saying, quote, Solomon, your son will reign after me, and he will sit upon my throne in my, like in, in, in my place. Ki ken se hayom haze. So, um, again, the key is picking up from Shava, and then if I'll, so I I swore. So what is it that I swore? Just as I swore then, what do I swear now? Thus, Cain is thus or so. Cain means like yes in, in modern Hebrew. Um, but it and it, it, it can mean that. I mean it does mean that here, but it's like uh thus verily in old English, I guess. Thus I will do ese. So this is from asa to do or to make, and it's just a cal imperfect. First common singular, so e'ese, te'ese, te'ese, ye'ese, te'ese. Um, I say those paradigms, by the way, so that it sort of begins to set in place. Um, so eshmor, tishmor, tishmori, yeshmor, tishmor. If you if you say those uh, to yourself or you hear somebody else say them, it, it tends to set in that pattern. So e'ese, te'ese, te'ese, ye'ese, te'ese. 
thus, verily, surely, I will do Hayom Hazeh. Hayom Hazeh. So Zeh is acting attributively here. You have two Ha's. Ha ha. Um, Hayom, Yom is day. Hazeh, this, this day. So today, uh, this day, thus I will do. So essentially, you know, he's saying, I promised that I would put Solomon on the throne after I died. Well, guess what? Today, I'm doing it. So, um, and her response. Vatikod bat sheva apayim eretz. This is interesting. Um, vatishtachu, uh, vat, sorry, vatishtachu uh, lamelech vatomer yechi adoni hamelech tavi leolam. So, vatikod, so this is from kadad, like to, to bow down. Um, so it's just a Kalvav consecutive and perfect third feminine singular from Kadad. This is how these um, geminate forms show up in the imperfect form. So and she in Bathsheba, notice this one's not in pausal form, so you get the regular Sheva here, seven. Um, so, uh, so in Bathsheba, uh, bowed down. Excuse me, apaim edits. This is interesting because what we normally uh, want to see is uh, aritza. I think it's with the path act. I can't remember. Let's just look real quick. What verse is that? 31a. I'll bet that's what it shows down here. 31a. Yep. Arza. Notice that. <clears throat> so this is what I'm looking at, just so everybody can see it. Arza. So, um, what does what is the difference between Eretz and Arza? Uh, actually, it'd be Arza, Arza. The difference is. This is the directive hey, so toward the ground. You remember your form habaita, habaita. This is to the house. So what she's doing here is Bathsheba bowed down, uh, like her nose, you would expect to the earth, like to the ground. But it's not, it's just edits. Um there are a couple of places that this happens. I don't remember. Obviously off the top of my head where they would be, but um yeah, so that's why you would expect the artsa to the artsa to the ground. But nonetheless. Um uh Vatishtahu. So this is from that uh Hishtafel form. We're not gonna go through that just because yeah, we're not gonna go through that again because it's a little too complex, but Basically, this is uh, to worship. Um, so she bowed down and she worships. It's just a, uh, another Vav consecutive and perfect form, third feminine singular. Uh, La Melech, so to the king. Uh, and of course, this Lama here is probably marking the object. So when she bowed, and Bathsheba bowed down her face to the ground, on the ground, whatever. And she worshipped her. She, she she prostrated herself before the king, and she said, "Vatomer, yechi Adonai." So this is a, a jussive form. This is from Chaya, which means to live. This is the uh, jussive form. So let live, my lord, the king David. Uh, so this is like you know, uh, long live the king, right? Sort of the same thing. So may. My lord, the king, David, all these are in apposition to one another. May my lord, the king, David, live, ostensibly live a long time. And, and of course, it's not ostensibly here. It's le olam, forever. Olam is, you know, perpetuity. It's the distant future, 
with no end in sight. I think that's the idea. Um, so may uh, my lord, the king David, live forever. So she's very happy. Vayomer Hamelach David, Kir Uli le Tzadok, sorry, Tzadok Hakohen, U Lenatan, Hanavi, Uliv Nayahu, Ben Yehoyada, Vayavo Ulif Ne Hamelach. Okay. Okay. Uh, and the king, David, and King David said, Kir U, another. Uh, imperative form, masculine plural from kara, same as what we saw before. Kir uli, and a notice here marked again by the Lamed. Uh, Zadok, the priest. Um, so summon to me Zadok, the priest. And also, here is uh, your Lamed again, marking the object. And Nathan, the prophet, Navi. And also... Uh, Benayahu, um, son of Jehoiada. So summon, summon all these people to me. And then it happens, and they came before the king, so just another Cal Vav consecutive and perfect um, third plural, third masculine plural from Bo. And they came before the king. Verse 33, Vayomer hamelech lahem kechu imachem et avde adonechem v'hir kavtem et shlomo v'ni al ha-pirda asher li v'horadtem oto el gichon. So, and the king said to them, Another vav, vav, consecutive and perfect, uh, third masculine singular from Amar. The king said to them, Lahem here, li lechalach lo la, lanu lahem lahen, lachem lachen, sorry, lachem lachen, lahem lahen. And the king said to them, Kechu, this is from Lakach. So in the imperative form, Kach, Kechi, Kechu. Looks like a final one, doesn't it? Kechu, that that llama, uh, yeah, the llama drops off. Uh, so, and we'll talk about that when we get to it in the grammar. But uh, so, Kach, Kechi, Kechu, Kachna. So, uh, take. With you, imachem. So this is im is with, and then imachem with you. Et avde. So this is eved. This is good to look at. Eved. If you wanted to say, so it's a slave or servant, whatever. If you wanted to say slaves, im, and you would get shiva comets, evadim. Actually, this would. Go to a composite shavah vadim because that's a guttural. And when you make this in the construct, im goes to a, right? But because this is a segulet, it goes back to its one syllable base. Avd. Where did it go? No, oh, right there. Avde. So the servants of uh, your. Lord, your lords. Um, okay. <clears throat> so what we need to pick up for the rest of this is you've got an imperative form here. And if you remember the, um, the way that they, they call it an indirect volative chain, the way that they continue on, what they'll do is instead of writing imperative after imperative after imperative, what they will do is they will have an imperative or a volitional form up here, and then they will have vav 
consecutive perfects. So notice these are not imperfects. We have a tem ending. So these are vav consecutive perfects, and these are indirect volative chains. In other words, you have an imperative, some text, vav, and then a perfect, oops, form, and then some more text, uh, and a vav plus perfect. All of these are going to carry the nuance of that imperative. So if you know we translate through this here, so take with you, blah, 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 and, <coughs> excuse me, this is a hifil form, so you can see the hi up front. Uh, the tem is your ending for the second masculine plural, so you, plural, and then resh, this is actually a really nice form. Resh, kaf, beit, rachav, rechev is like a chariot, so rachav is to ride, and the hifil is a causative, often. So, and like cause to ride, which is a really wooden way of saying that. But notice it's an imperative. It's taking on that imperative nuance, not an imperative form. It's taking on the imperative nuance. So, and cause to ride who? Shlomo, Solomon, and cause Solomon to ride, like make Solomon ride upon, and Solomon, my son, Vini, upon the donkey. Peter Da. Um, it's probably more nuanced than that, but whatever, just for now. Donkey's fine. Um, so essentially, make him put him up on a donkey and make him ride. Asher uh, Li, which is to me. So my donkey, right? Put him up on my mule, whatever. Uh, I need to study a little uh, zoology. Try to get some more nuance here in the animal kingdom, but whatever. Um, okay, so put them up, make them ride, and another hithil form. Notice it's in the perfect as well, so vav, uh, consecutive perfect. <laughs> Digital Hammurabi caused me to learn Hebrew. Uh, that's right. I appreciate that. I really appreciate you guys being here, all 10 of you. Um, so uh, Hithil form here, another perfect, a vav consecutive perfect. So again, it's carrying the nuance of this imperative here. And this one is from Yarad. Yarad means to descend or to go down. Again, please, if you're watching this and you, you know, you're, you're here for the grammar, but you, um, you don't, uh, like you, you had this reading seems, over your head or something, just you know, let, let it wash over you. Don't get discouraged. Uh, again, I'm. I know it sounds a little more advanced. I'm. I'm trying to make it so that everybody gets something out of this. Uh, but don't let it discourage you. Uh, Higher evolutionary says, "Hi Josh, can you share which reading we will look at next week? I really want to try to look at the material in advance so I can look up some new vocab. We are just going to continue on with First Kings until we finish First Kings chapter one." And then I'll decide if we're going to keep going uh, or if we're going to switch to something else. Uh, but I, I probably will just continue on with First Kings until we do Jonah, which will probably be like a break and then we'll come back. But we'll see. But in, until further notice, we're going to be doing uh, First Kings. Good question. Or, yeah, it was a question. I'm sorry. I'm trying to remember how you worded it. Okay. So, Yadrad means to go down. To descend. So if you put that in the hithil, to cause to go down and make him go down, here's oto. So this is et, the definite direct object marker. And when you add <clears throat> that suffix on, the form ends up oto. So oti, otcha, otach, oto. Ota, and so on. So, and cause him to go down, you know, make him go down. El Gijon. So we won't, you know, go into the geography, a geography lesson, but the Gijon is like the Gijon Spring. 
anyway, this is a royal descent, putting him on top of the animal and then uh, having him go down. This is to go down to a public place. This is a, this is a royal something, something very public. Um, and if you think about what Jehoiada did, uh, thinking about the geography, you know, not, not as public. <laughs> um, so, but this is supposed to be a public display. Hey, I am anointing. I want, I want Solomon anointed king and I want everybody to see it. So, uh, we've got time for one more verse. So, umashach oto sham tzadok hakohen v'natan hanavi lamelech al Yisrael utekatem bashofar v'amartem yichi hamelech shlomo It's pretty cool. Um, Malachi Walker asks, is there a passage in the Tanakh that's generally agreed upon as the hardest to translate. Uh, I think Numbers 5 is pretty, uh, not Numbers 5. Um, um, Judges 5. Judges 5 is pretty tough. I think that's where the poem's at. Um, of course, uh, yeah, that's that's what strikes me. That's what comes to mind. Um you know, poetic texts are obviously very difficult. Um, okay, so, and again, this is carrying on mashach, so you have uh, another uh, cow, vav, consecutive, perfect form. So it's ostensibly carrying over the nuance of that imperative that we've seen. So the indirect uh, volative chain continues. And anoint, uh, oh no, maybe it's not, sorry. Maybe it stopped. Interesting, I wonder, interesting at the textual note here what that says. Anyway, so this very well may just be, and Zadok the priest will anoint him there. Yeah, that's probably what that is. And Nathan the prophet Uh, yeah. I wonder if this is, if they're saying this is a plot. Now I want to go look. 34A, let's look. Yeah, plural. Okay. So let me explain why. Uh, where am I? This passage repeats itself quite a bit, so it's sometimes tough to figure out. So notice here, you have Zadok the priest as uh, one subject of this verb. And I would imagine that this, I should have looked at that while I was there, but I wonder if they're saying uh, there should be a verb here as well. But anyway, um, Zadok the priest is the subject of this verb. And it, for all the world, looks like Nathan the prophet is also the subject. So now let me, I want to go look BB in 34. So what they're saying here, it's not what I thought. Uh, so probably deleted is what they're saying. So, okay, let me explain that very quickly. Um, so here, here's our problem. Mashach, this is a cow, vav, consecutive, perfect. Third, masculine, singular, right? So you expect a singular uh, subject here, which you get, Zadok the priest. but here you have Nathan the prophet, and it looks like it's also using this verbal form. So you, you know we translate this, and I, I'd be interesting to see how they they do this. But uh, and Zadok the priest will anoint him there, and Nathan the prophet will anoint him as. Uh, I mean, you know, Balaamid here might. Uh, be interesting that maybe that's just part of it. Uh, king over Israel. So it looks like he's, you know, they're both using this. Um, what note A is saying is that there are some manuscripts that have, I didn't look at which ones, but some manuscripts that appear to have a plural, which would make 
sense, sort of. Uh, it's still still strange to me, um, syntax. But BB here says that uh, probably Nathan the prophet should be deleted. So then this would be read, and uh, Zadok the, pri uh, the priest will anoint him there as king over Israel. Um, so anyway, that one's kind of tricky. Be interesting to read up on the textual, how, uh, text critics have, have dealt with this anyway. Um, okay. So another, uh, Cal Vav consecutive, um, perfect form. It's just interesting. Interesting. That whole line now I'm thinking about it. Anyway, uh, so taka is to blow. It can also mean some other things, but to blow when it's with a horn, and here's a horn, the shofar. So, and you will blow uh, either with, or this is marking the object, the shofar, the horn, and say, you will say, another cal, vav, consecutive, perfect, Second uh, masculine plural from Amar, and you will say, um, again, may he live, may the King Solomon live, long live the King Solomon. So very public uh, pronouncement of Solomon. Uh, you know what? I wonder if we can. Yeah, let me let me do one more. I just quickly do one more. I'll go. Just so that uh kind of finish the thought here. Va'alitem <sighs> acharav uva. Actually, you know what? This is going to be also tricky. Um. Yeah, we'll save this one. It's it's continuing the thought, but uh, the command. But ah. yeah, we'll save it for next time. Okay, sorry indecisive josh here all right well let me put this banner back up as i'm closing just remember uh this wednesday 4 p.m eastern standard time we're gonna have joel baden on which is gonna be fantastic if you have ever been curious about uh the formation of the pentateuch you know we have a video on this on our channel actually if somebody wants to if one of our mods wants to grab it the formation of the pentateuch i think that's what it's called or piecing together the pentateuch i think what it's called and I'll try to throw it in the try to remember to throw it in the description, the link to it in the description. But you can kind of get an, an intro to um, the different theories of how the Pentateuch was put together. But this Wednesday at 4 p.m., we're going to have Dr. Joel Baden on, and he is going to give us he's he's an expert in this. He's going to give us uh, you know some a good good introduction to and some detailed information about the different theories. Uh, on how the Pentateuch is put together. Is it put together by Moses? You know, singularly? Probably not. Um, so how is it that we have come to the final form of the Pentateuch that we currently have? So be sure to to tune in to that. But um, guys, I really appreciate you being here, all of you that have watched and participated. It's been a really great time. And uh, until next time, resist poor scholarship. Always ask, how do you know that?